The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Oh, it's you. What kind of a greeting is that? Oh, it's you. Well, Sam, I may be only your secretary and all that, but I do have feelings, you know. What have I done now? If you'll recall... Yes? You were supposed to take me to the Geary Theater last night. Yeah? And you never showed up. Well, Effie, I... Oh, I know. Hmm? You'll make up some big story like you always do. Always an excuse. No, I'll try to tell you the truth. And then... The truth. I... It'll probably be a story about at least two or three people being killed. Yeah. How you had to be there to straighten the whole thing out. Well, as a matter of fact, And then uh... there'll be beautiful women with hair like carved smoke and mm. crimson slashes for mouths. Mm -hmm. You would leave that out. Now that you mention it, Effie, And you'll throw in shooting and getting knocked out and glass keying your way into houses and anything else you can think of. Effie. Well, if you think that I'll fall for that. Effie, will you please? What's your big fat? Story. You've already told everything about it, but the title, I might as well add that. My big fat story is called The Shot in the Dark Caper. Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Spade? No, Effie, don't be like this. I promise you tonight, right after this report, we'll go to the theater. And we'll have dinner, too. Any place you want. Sound good? You're the employer. The faster we do the report, the faster we get out. And I won't even take time out for a drink. So come on, let's go, shall we? Hmm? <laughs> you see? I can't stay mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> Date, fill it in. To managing editor, San Francisco Evening Gazette. City, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the shot in the dark caper. Or... Stop the presses. Spade has his pants caught in them. Caught? Dear News Hawk, oh. the next time you have a bright idea about a story, count me out. There's too much work for the money it pays, and the glory just doesn't exist. I don't mind being knocked on the head, shot at, lied to, double-crossed, and otherwise treated cruelly by circumstance, but to do it all in one night just so you can have a scoop and then be referred to in your columns as a Gazette staff member, well... My professional pride was severely injured. I am a detective, sir, and nobody staff member. Well, now that that's off my chest, here in journalistic prose is what happened starting yesterday afternoon. Sam say Detective Agency? Yes, he is. It's for you, Sam. I'll take it in here, Ed. Spade? Yes, is Woodrow Wilson. Really? Well, I'm sorry. I have Teddy Roosevelt on the other phone. It might take some time. You better try me later. Bye. Spade! Huh? Somehow I thought you were above that sort of carny repartee. I am above nothing, sir, as long as it's ethical. Now, which Woodrow Wilson is this? I'm the new managing editor of the Evening Gazette. Well, welcome to town. What can I do for I you? I have a job you might like. An interesting job and interesting money. How interesting? If you find out what I want, you can almost name your own price. Can you get over here in three minutes? With any sort of a tailwind, I'll make it in two. A new track record. Take a seat, Spade. Hmm. Now, uh, what is this interesting job? First, let me say I don't know much about you personally, but you come well recommended. I've tried. Second, this is a confidential matter, and I want it to remain that way. Of course. I'm going to trust you as I would one of my own staff members. Hmm. The police aren't to find out about it until it's all over. And if any other newspaper gets it, you might as well leave town. Woody, old boy, the man doesn't live who can say I ever double-crossed him. For money or love or anything else. I or had love... to say it so we'd understand each oh. other. I'll take a look at this news photo. Yes? One of our boys snapped it. What do you see? A street intersection. Old Farrell, I'd say. Two automobiles hit head-on. An ambulance, a couple of people, injured, assorted crowd. We took that picture three days ago. Tuesday night, routine accident picture. Mm -hmm. But this morning, when we were filing it, I looked at it again. And I noticed something startling. Look at it. It's a shot in the dark, but I smell a story. Well, maybe I have a cold, but uh, whatever it is, escapes me. On the right side of the picture is an apartment house. Mm -hmm. Now count up six floors and look at the fourth window across from the left. Here. Use this magnifying glass. Mm. Oh, what do you know? Somebody just fired off a gun. That's it. All you can see is a hand and a smoking gun. Mm. You can't even tell whether the hand's male or female. But somebody shot at something, probably a person, just a second before that picture was taken. You want me to find out why, huh? This calls for a detective, not a reporter. 
There hasn't been a single homicide, suicide, or gunshot wound reported in the city since that happened. Now, I want the story. Get it. Okay, Chief. Get ready to rip out page one. The apartment house was the Greystone. It was actually an apartment hotel and a little shabby. I entered an hour later with a suitcase and an out-of-town look. The nameplates on the mailboxes showed about five vacancies, including one on the sixth floor. I rang the manager's door butter. Good afternoon. I'd uh, like to rent an apartment if I could. Uh, come in, come in. Mm. Just uh, drop your suitcase any place. Mm? My name's Ed Barry. How are you? Your suitcase is leaking. Oh? We charge one price, one seventy-five per night. Well, I uh, I don't have that kind of cash with me or my checkbook. Uh, could I pay you tomorrow? Oh, well, sure thing. Your name? Mark Humboldt. Mark Humboldt. Uh, B O L T. Yes, that's it. Where are you from, Mr. Humboldt? The New York boy, New York, Forty-eight East Fifty-first Street. Ah, uh, near Broadway. Mm-hmm. Next to kin? Huh? Any family, uh, relatives? No, no. Oh, you own a car? Look, I'm just running an apartment, not taking out life insurance. Well, you see, there's a state law here that requires us to get this sort of information. I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. No car. Uh, a bank account? Corn Exchange Bank. You own any property? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, Albany, New York. Oh. Uh, just how much, would you say? Six feet in a cemetery. I expect to be buried there. <laughs> yeah, well... I guess that about takes care of him. Uh, anything on the sixth floor? Well, why the sixth, particularly? My lucky number. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Maybe later. Right now, we got nothing on the sixth. Come on, I'll show you around. In a few minutes, I was ensconced in room 512. As he stood in the doorway, Ed Bering, the manager, scanned my luggage, my clothes, my ring and wristwatch as if he were trying to estimate what he could get for me from a fence. After he went back to his apartment, I took a stroll up to the sixth floor. Woody Wilson and I figured the gun incident took place in apartment 608. So I counted back from the end of the corridor and found we were right. 608 was silent. I knocked, but no one answered. So I sprung the lock and went in. The place was absolutely empty. No furniture, no nothing. In fact, it was being completely remodeled. It's gonna look swell when they finish, huh? Huh? I said it's gonna look swell. Well, where did you come from? Oh, gee. I guess maybe I startled you, huh? A little. I was just coming down the hall, you know, taking some of these groceries in, and I saw you standing there. You're new here, huh? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Here, let me uh, carry some of those things. Oh, well, say thanks. <laughs> You know, you're the kind of man a girl should have around. Well, I've tried to convince several of them. Oh, who are you kidding? A big, <laughs> handsome guy like you wouldn't have any trouble getting a girl? Well... At least not if I was the girl. <laughs> <coughs> well, you know best. My place is down here. Shall we go? Well, why not? My name's Honey Kane. What's yours? Uh, Mark Humboldt. Gee, what a fascinating name. Oh, not half as fascinating as yours. Really? Mm. Say, isn't it wonderful how fate just throws two people together? The bags of groceries we were carrying had a layer of dust on them, and the bags looked as if they'd made 50 trips to the grocery store. No one had to hit me on the head, Sam Spade detective. She was small in peroxide, and if you like them stupid, small in peroxide. She lived in apartment 620 with a roommate who was quite a bit different. Prettier, smarter, and quieter. Sandra, I want you to meet this very nice gentleman, Mr. Mark Humberg. Humboldt. Oh, sure, I remember the Mark part, but this is Sandra Lynn. Uh, how do you do, Miss Lynn? Hello. Yes, well, <clears throat> nice day. Great. Well, I... Just put the groceries down here, huh? Oh. There. Now, let's have some fun. Like fun, Mr. Humboldt? Wouldn't be without it. <laughs> You're priceless. Well, come on, let's start with a drink. How about you, Sandra? No, no, you kids have your fun. I'm going out for a walk. Ah. Tumble, you're supposed to be looking at me. An hour later, under the pretext of going out for some snuff, I shook her off and left. The next half hour went to giving the apartment house a thorough casing. I looked at all the names on the mailboxes, and the only one that rang a bell was one Max Barstow, a former heavyweight who never got past club fighting. I inquired about him of charming Ed Berry, the manager. 
Uh, Max Boss, though? Yeah, I tried his apartment. He isn't home. Yeah, well, you see, he won't be home for some time. You huh? see, he took a vacation. Went to visit his family in uh, Portland. Well, when did he leave? Last Tuesday night. I remember him saying, Ed, I won't be back for a while. Look after things, will you? Well, you have a good memory. Yeah. Hey, can you tell me something about those two girls in 620? Why? One of them made a pass at me. Well, mister, I feel this way. I rent apartments to responsible adults. What they do is their business. You won't get any trouble from me. Now, that isn't what I asked. I always like to be sure. Now, are they honest, hard-working girls? I don't know nothing about them, but uh, let me tell you something confidential, mister. Why look a gift horse in the mouth, hmm? <laughs> Well, I gumshooed around the apartment house some more, and one thing was sure. They were making a number of extensive alterations. For example, in the basement, there was a new cement floor. Said cement floor had been laid, I was told by the janitor, Wednesday morning, the morning after a gun was fired in 608, the same morning on which Max Barstow suddenly left to visit his parents. And about here in the plot, it was dramatically correct to wonder if Max might be sleeping under the furnace with a new cement overcoat covering him. I went back to my apartment for a couple of long ones and some thought. It was getting along about supper time when there was a feminine knock. I guess it to be Miss Room Service herself, Honey Kane. But no. Better. Much better. May I come in? You may. Shall I uh, leave the door open? I'd rather you close it. Anything to make you feel at home? Uh, drink? No. Talk. Oh. What are you doing here, Sam? The name's Humboldt. Mark Humboldt. All right. Say it any way you want. Mm. But I've seen you around. I know who you are. You move in today, and half hour later, you find our apartment. Why? Your apartment found me. At least half of it did. The gift horse part. Uh, maybe so, but I figured you helped a little somewhere. Hmm. What are you trying to get on us? Nothing, nothing. I just moved in here for a place to live. With one suitcase and a bottle? Well, I'm an actor. Look, whatever it is, lay off, will you? I've had enough trouble in my life. Things are just starting to go right. Sandra, I don't know what's on your mind, but as far as I'm concerned, you're clean. All right. Maybe I made a mistake. I'll try to make it up to you sometime. Well, maybe you can start right now. I think I'll open the door again. Now, just a question. Seen anything of Max Barstow lately? I knew it was something. I knew it. No, I haven't seen Max Barstow lately. He went somewhere to visit his family, and I'm telling you either leave me alone or something's going to happen to you, you won't write. She stormed out looking lovely all the way, and I sat very quietly for a minute. It was the second time somebody said it. Max Barstow was visiting his family. And that was very interesting because, you see, Max Barstow didn't have any family. When he first started fighting, he was under the aegis of the St. John's Orphanage. So, what was all this rehearsed account of his absence? I watched at the window to see if Sandra Lynn went anywhere, and she appeared on the street. I was out of the room and down the stairs, presto. Ten blocks later, she turned in at a brownstone on Polk Street, went in the first apartment on the first floor. Fifteen minutes later, she hurried out, and I went up to the apartment and knocked. The door opened cautiously. Yes, what is it you want? Is Mr. Uh, Fairchild in? Nobody here by that name. You've got the wrong address. Now, just a minute. He used to live here. No more he does. Well, could you tell me where I could find him, Mr. Uh... Sigmund Parker. Pol I don't know. Try the minute. <laughs> on the way out, I looked at the card on his door buzzer. It listed his apartment as belonging to a Mr. Rothschild. At the moment, there was nothing to be made out of it, so I went back to the Greystone. And when I got to my room, it was very obvious that I'd been visited during my absence. Yeah? Oh, well, it's you. What happened to my suitcase? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Humble, but I didn't realize it before. You see, that apartment was already rented, so I guess you'll have to find one someplace else. Look, you have four other vacant ones in this apartment house. Give me one of those. Sorry, no vacancy. Well, then give me my suitcase. Uh, yeah, that's the one that leaks. Uh, just a minute, I'll bring it out, Mr. Humble. I'll go in and get it myself, Mr. Barry. I Barron. said stay out. I said I'll go in and get it. Right, you will. He swung at me, I blocked, and stepped into him. He gave way, and I followed in. And then as I moved into the apartment, someone stepped out from behind the door. I turned, but it was too late. I was sandbagged, and the face behind the arm that swung it looked an awful lot like that of Max Barstow. I remember asking myself as I went down, if Max Barstow wasn't shot in room 608, who was? You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade.
three chimes mean good times on NBC. On Sunday, March 4th, that's one week from this Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air will present radio's most exciting dramatic event. It's a full hour and a half presentation of Shakespeare's immortal Hamlet. John Gielgud will portray Hamlet, Pamela Brown, the Queen, and Dorothy McGuire will appear as Ophelia. The intrigue, beauty, and romance of Hamlet come to life Sunday, March 4th on Theater Guild on the Air. And now back to the Shot in the Dark caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I wasn't out for long, but it was long enough to have been carried out of the apartment manager's place and dumped in an alley. I sat up and rubbed the back of my head and discovered the boys had a sense of humor. Pinned on my chest was a note that said, beat it. This time, when I went back, I had my gun handy to hand. Nobody was home at Mr. Baring's apartment, so for something to do, I looked in on Max Barstow's diggings, 413. I glanced keyed in and turned on the lights. And a search revealed items, a rent receipt showing Max was paid up for two months and intended to stay put. But more interesting were two phony detective badges, a policeman's uniform, and a flash camera. Couple these with a dossier on a man named Sigmund Pulkus, and I knew just what Max had been doing since the fight game stopped paying his bill. It read, Sigmund Pulkus, 60 years old, Minneapolis, just sold two restaurants for $175,000. Intends to retire and settle down in San Francisco. That's as far as I got when Honey poured herself on me again. Yeah. What are you doing in Mr. Barstow's apartment? Come in. Come in. Max, you shouldn't be here. Mm. Mr. Barstow ever found out. Honey, you? honey, you can drop the act. Max. You know who I am, and I know who you are. You're part of the bait for one of the hey. oldest rackets in the world. world. The Badger Game. Who, me? You. All right, Sam. I didn't know who you were at first until Sandra told me. Now, you tell me, what are you doing in Max's room? A number of things. First of all, getting enough evidence on him to give him a free vacation on the state. Second, I wanted to see who would show up and why. Now, what's your story? I just dropped in to see if Max was here. Try again. Sam, if I tell you anything, will you leave me alone? If I can bear it. I came over to get some things for Max. You know Where's he me. staying? Right across the street in the Arlington, 314. Mm -hmm. Ed Baring manages both apartment houses. Why doesn't Max stay here? Who are you working for, Sam? I'm just asking. A client. Not the police? No. Sam, I don't have a thing to do with the mark Max is working on now. Sigmund Polkus. Some old man. Did you hear any shooting here last Tuesday night in apartment 608? Oh, Sam, I didn't hear a thing. Not a single thing. All right, get whatever you came for. But remember this. You tell Max I was here, and I'll tie you into something that'll get you to Hatchapi if it's the last thing I do. Oh, sure. <laughs> I knew she'd be impressed with that type of threat because her kind of girl lives by playing tag with the law. They want to be it as seldom as possible. I finished the dossier on Pocus and thought a more businesslike visit to the old man was in order. What, what is it? Oh, you. I want to talk with you, Mr. Pocus. Come in. I want to talk to you. Now. Now. Stand right where you are. He was pointing a gun in one shaking hand right at my chest. And as close as I could tell, it looked very much like the gun I'd seen in your picture, Wilson. And the hand that held it was the very same hand. I tried to think of something clever to say. At this stage of my life, it would be very easy to shoot you, mister. Look, I came here maybe to help save you a lot of trouble. Now, if you listen to me, I'll... I know why you came here, because I killed Max Barstow. I'll give you a choice. Will you take money or will I... Will I shoot you right here? I'd take the money, but you didn't kill Max Barstow. Don't tell me what I did when I know what I did. Sandra told me one of his gang members was looking for me. But she doesn't understand the power of money. How much will you take to leave us alone to our happiness? What is Max Barstow to you now that he's dead? Look, I don't want any money. I just want it. I felt like a ghost. The gun was pointed directly at me, but nothing hit me. I was surprised, albeit gratified. The little man must have thought I was wearing a bulletproof vest. He didn't look surprised, though. He just folded. I disarmed him and pushed him down into a chair. Oh, I had to do it. I had to. I, I couldn't let you spoil the only bit of happiness I had left in my life. Mr. Pocus, you tried to shoot me, and I'm grateful. It told both of us something. To begin with, you can't kill anybody with blanks in your blanks. gun. Blanks? I don't know blanks. Where did you get the gun? I... 
I always have guns. Always? And you don't know the difference between real bullets and blanks? You got it from Sandra, and she loaded it, right? Maybe you should know, gangster. Look, I'm a private detective. Name of Sam Spade. Now, if you help me, I'll help you. When did Sandra give you this gun? Last Tuesday? Yes. Did you use it to shoot Barstow? Yes. Then he couldn't be dead, could he? This gun wouldn't kill a fly, and besides, I met Max Barstow tonight, I alive. I saw him fall to the floor, and blood came out of his coat with my own eyes. Mr. Pocus, you just came from Minneapolis with $175,000. You walked into a shakedown gang. They're after your money. That girl, Sandra, is just bait. Oh, don't speak about Sandra that way. Sure, she tried to shake me up for money, but only because that meant that Barstow make her. She was a slave. She couldn't get away from him. Why did she stage a phony murder with you killing Barstow? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm so confused. Tell me how it happened. Oh, Barstow posed as a policeman. He found me in Sandra's apartment. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to pay him $5,000, but Sandra told me she loved me, and Barstow was a racketeer. We were to meet in apartment 608 for to pay him. Mm -hmm. She gave me a gun to frighten him with, but instead I... Killed. Nuts, 5,000. They knew how much money you had, and they wanted to get all of it away from you on a phony murder scare. Sandra doesn't want my money away from me. She loves me. Mr. Polkus, I'm sorry disillusionment should come to you so late in life. But... I say she loved me, and I can prove it. How? This morning, she became Mrs. Sigmund Polkus. <laughs> that made me sit down and think things through a little more carefully. She could have gotten his money, or most of it, without marrying him. Maybe she did love him. Or maybe they felt he was too dumb to pay off. Or maybe she married him so she could murder him. And maybe a dozen other things. His suitcases were packed, and he said that he and Sandra planned to leave town tonight. He'd been waiting for her when I came in, but she was already two hours late. I could think of only one place she could be. So I left poor Mr. Pulkus and went to the Arlington. 314, the address Honey Kane had given me. And she was there. Now, now, honey, quiet down and tell me what you're scared about. In the bedroom, Max. He's dead. <laughs> A knife, John. When'd you find him? Five minutes ago. I was with him before. And then I went out for some Chinese food when I came back. All right, all right. Who else was here tonight? I didn't see anybody. But, but what? He was awful mad at Sandra. Said she was double-crossing him and he wouldn't let her get away with it. I went back to Polkus's place. He was gone, but his bags were still there, so I figured he'd be back. I put out the lights and sat in a chair. Sigmund. Sigmund. <gasps> Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask me what I'm doing here. Where's Polkus? Well, if he's smart, he's on a train back to Minneapolis. I... I'm going to look for him. And you're not going anywhere. Sit down. Oh, yes, I am. No, you're... Leave me alone. Leave me. I said you're not going anywhere unless it's to jail. What are you playing Mr. District Attorney for? Because you killed Max Barstow. Now tell me why. Oh, don't be a joker. Max Barstow's as live as you are. I'm not talking about the phony murder stage for the benefit of Polkus. Barstow was stabbed to death a half hour ago. He wasn't. He was. I saw him. Who? You. Oh, Sam, I didn't. I didn't. I saw him earlier today, but, but he was all right. You married Polkus to double-cross him, didn't you? You were going to skip town with the Mark. Well, sure I was, so why would I kill Max? Because he knew what you were going to do, that's why. I tell you, I didn't. I couldn't kill anybody. Why did you... What did you have planned for Polkus? A shove over to the Grand Canyon? No, I... I love the old guy. Come on, we'll drop in at police headquarters. No, Sam. No. Sam. Nothing. I wouldn't take you with the U.S. Mint thrown in. Will you let me go if I tell you what happened? If I tell you who killed Barstow? Well, if you didn't do it, nobody could hold you. For murder, anyway. Baring. Ed Baring did it. We... We planned the whole thing together. It was a freeze-out on Barstow. Somehow he found out it had to take care of him. I didn't have anything to do with it. I tried to tell him not to. Tried to tell him not to what? Yeah. I've got a gun in my hand, Baring. So have I. Which one of us is going to shoot first? You wouldn't shoot. But he did. Period. End of report. Sam! Is that all? Well, what do you want? An echo? No. But he shot you and you're all right. Mm -hmm. Were they blanks like the other guns? They were not. They were genuine steel-jacketed bullets. But, uh, you didn't I... listen carefully enough, Effie. I figured he'd shoot right away. He did once, just as I jumped sideways and fired two shots back. Did you 
kill him? No, no, but he's down with a little case of lead poisoning, though, under police guard. You're wonderful. It's true. All right, go type it up. Off with him. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, you're invited to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony under the direction of Bruno Walter. Featured soloist for tomorrow's performance is celebrated violinist Joseph Figetti, who will be heard in Mozart's brilliant concerto for violin and orchestra. It's the very finest in musical listening every Saturday with the NBC Symphony. <laughs> I don't understand. Two wits. Well, what happened to nice old Mr. Polkis? Mm. Why wasn't he in his apartment waiting for Sunday? Well, he did just what I thought he should have done. He walked down to the railroad depot and got on the first train for Minneapolis. Who knows? Maybe he's opened a new restaurant. Yeah. And, uh, what happened to Sandra? Well, she's being held as an accessory to murder, among other things. Well, if they were married... That's well... enough, Effie. That's enough. Do you want me to make everything so simple that everybody will be able to figure it out? No. But, uh... but you what? I get confused sometimes. That's most of your charm, Effie. You know, if you were brisk and efficient and cold, we'd never have any fun, would we? I guess not, Pam. <laughs> we do have a good time at times, don't we? Yes, we do indeed. Like right now. Come here. <laughs> Fire in a man's veins. <laughs> Maddening, that's what. Don't say any more, Sam. I don't know what I might do. I'd love it, whatever it was. i better say good night, Sam. Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Loreen Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by John Michael Hayes. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Sam Spade lives a life of peril. Well, in these days, we all live in a time of peril. Each of us is contributing something to help meet the emergencies that we face as a nation. There is one definite thing that every one of us can do to help. February 28th is being celebrated as Red Cross Day. Supported by the people and schooled by years of experience in war and peace in times of disaster... The Red Cross has now been assigned unprecedented tasks in the interest of national security and world peace. You can help mobilize the forces of mercy for the protection and defense of your family, your community, and the nation through generous support of the 1951 Red Cross Fund campaign. Join the magnificent Montague then at Duffy's Tavern on NBC.